afternoon podcast. But maybe it's useful to just start with, uh, why are you guys doing this now? <laughs> Neil, you want to go first? Sure. Sure, I'll take it. Um, All right. Why are we doing this now? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the interesting part is we started this at the height before Netflix lost 80% of its value, before NFTs and crypto lost 80% of their value. But uh, as much as some people might think that um, that would have been a heartbringer, the reason we're doing this now is the landscape for creatives and people that are creating new content has never been better. You, you think about uh, Bob Iger the other day was, was interviewed on Code and you know former CEO of Disney talking about how there's now infinite shelf space and infinite consumption and the way that people are consuming products is just different. And now that everybody has one of these in their pockets, they watch whether it's NFL football or movies or whatever, they have this two screen experience. And what we wanted to do was, was push the boundaries on how um, fans can engage with content, um, how great content can get made, um, how the artists from the actors all the way to the set designers can participate in different ways. And we've been blessed to have a, a community that's really, really embraced it. So why now was as much as, as it's um, a little bit of a, a crypto winter and a, and a winter for a lot of the, the production companies out there, it's going to be coming out to a, a pretty exciting spring and, and having people like Paul and Alex Ponovic uh, and Matt and Jeremy and all the actors that jumped on board with us take this journey with us has been has been pretty exciting and you have you filmed uh how much of it i kind of went to the site and i liked how you kind of watch a, a scene and then you kind of get a comic book and then you kind of watch a scene and kind of seeing the arc start to come together but how much is like filmed as like like a me movie versus like a tv show versus you know filming in like a, a new way well, I'll pass to Paul in a minute because he, he can really speak to how the, the cast helped build the world. But what we did was, um, uh, yeah, so just for the audience, we, we used multimedia to tell to build this world. We went live action chapter, comic book chapter, live action chapter, comic book chapter to tell a linear story. And the reason we did that was the live action chapters allowed us to build character, go really deep on on. on um, uh, the, these leaders and these relationships by focusing for five to five to eight minutes with these live action episodes. But then the comic books would allow us to build worlds. We could draw incredible scenes and, you know, explosions and things that maybe we didn't have the budget for. But the concept behind everything we did was it was about planting the seed. It was about building this, um, just taking the first step towards what might be a TV show, what might be a movie thereafter, what what is a much larger world that even the fans have run with. Um, but it really was a, a chance to um, to almost create like a pre-pilot for the for this new sci-fi universe. And we were so lucky to have people like Paul get involved. I'll tell the story of how we got Paul involved in a minute because I think it speaks to uh, it speaks volumes to to not only uh, Paul as a person but also the uh the pride that the actors took with with what we were doing but actually you know what why, why don't i do that paul and then and then you can kind of share why you got involved but sure. um alex uh ponovic who's our my partner executive producer when we started this uh we were only going to do it started as an nft project that raised about six and a half million dollars in 30 minutes but the community really wanted more they wanted to know the backstory of these nfts so we were working with artists from Marvel and, and Electronic Arts, creating this incredibly beautiful NFT artwork. But when we started looking at building the, the, the lore and the mythology behind it, we were only going to do um, 10 scenes with a single actor showing a faction leader. But as the project grew, we decided to, to shrink it down, but give the audience much more. So when we were met with Matt and Jeremy, the, the, the writers and creators of the show, Alex, Matt, Jeremy, and I sat down and we really tried to rip out all the things that you we hated from other sci-fi shows, you know, where aliens had come from halfway across the galaxy only to be defeated by a DOS prompt or a computer virus that they hadn't seen coming. Um, and it was important to us to try to be as grounded as we can because great sci-fi is great allegory. And 
Alex goes, look, I don't know if we can get him, but you know who would be perfect for this, for this role in this world would be, would be Paul. So he gets on his phone, he calls Paul. Paul didn't pick up, must go on a voicemail. Calls back in 15 minutes. We get him on the Zoom call. All four of us are in the room. We ask him, Paul gets excited. He goes, look, whatever I can do, loved working with you guys before. Let me, let me dig into it, but I'm in. So the next day, phone rings again. It says Paul White. And honestly, my heart sank because I'm like, oh God, I'm sure he's spoken with his agent. His agent's been like, no, you're not doing this. This indie that's NFT funded, that's taking all these chances. And uh, he was going to call and be like, yeah, I, I can't do it, guys. But literally, he picks up the phone and starts critiquing why did the aliens come and what technology is going to be there and what was it? And it was so collaborative and, and the influence he brought to make it real from his time working with you know vets and, and all the work that he did um, supporting the American military on tours, um, but bringing the sense of realism and the passion he brought to it was, was infectious. That's cool to hear. Um... And in, in reading up a bit on Paul, he has kind of a bit of a, it seems like a Forrest Gump kind of background or, you know, you yeah. were this athlete that kind of stumbles into pro wrestling and right. um, through Hollywood. And, you know, I'm, I imagine just being as tall as you are kind of changes what happens when you walk into a lot of rooms about, you know, right. how, how you see the world. It, it does. I mean, you're always going to be judged, first of all, by how you look and your size and your presence, whether they judge you by your intelligence or your wit, your humor, or, oh, I don't want to meet you in a dark alley. Like, why not? I might know the way out. I'm yeah. a kind person, you know. But once you get past those hurdles, um, I, I think you'll find it easier to to get people over the shock value of the size and then see me as as a regular person. But that's something I had to deal with a long time ago. I mean, I was 6'2 at 12, so I've had to learn to deal with I'm hoping let to be people get their initial head. reaction and then then we'll get down to the nuts and bolts. But uh, going back to Gen Zero, is the thing that got me about One, I love Alex Ponovic. He's one of my dear, dear buddies. I, I've worked with him on a couple of projects. He played my brother in a, in a WWE movie we did called Vendetta. Um, he was a, a terrorist in another TV show I did. Um, so I've got a chance to be around out and I just like to do, we get along good. He's got a really solid background, did some boxing and, you know, he's a fun dude to be around. Tell me about this project. And I was like, uh, yeah, man, they sent me the script. And when I read through the script, I, uh, cause I'm a fan of sci-fi and, 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 and fantasy. And, and I mean, I play a lot of D and D, you know, I just played D Dungeons and Dragons just a couple of days ago. So, um, what attracted me about this is the potential for the series. And I knew Matt and Jeremy, because I'd also done an episode of Van Helsing with Alex. And so I knew the writers and the story concept they have is so much more solid than some of the other sci-fi things that I've seen, or even some of the books I've read. I mean, I've read the B.B. Larson books and Orson Scott Card and, and a lot of those uh, sci-fi books that are tremendous worlds and tremendous settings. But the, one of the things that attracted me about this series was, was the overwhelming dominance of the alien base, which is as it should be. If we're dealing with a superior technology, a superior race, whether the world unites together or not, you know, you're, you're bringing a pillow to a gunfight. There's just there's better technologies. And this story is set with the remnants of humanity that's left. There's, you know, there's like, you know, 90% of the world is wiped out. And then there's small pockets of humanity that as human beings and as we are, we will scavenge, we will find a way to survive, we will take technology, because there were some successful battles in this invasion due to do our own military might, but so there, there's technology that we're able to scavenge and re-engineer, and over time, um, this is like I think 200 years after the, or 300 years after the first invasion, there's been enough time for us to start to to understand some of that technology process it, implement it. And where once everyone was united against this incredible front, at the same time, human nature, you know, birds of a feather flock together. So then there's a lot of different factions that had different concepts on, uh, on how uh, the human race should evolve or our relationship to uh, the aliens that invaded. Um, should we be uh, obedient and be subservient and acquiesce to this higher power and strive to be uh, uh, whatever they need to survive. And then there's others that are 
strictly against it, engage at all costs. Uh, you know, and, and our faction to me has a, a kind of a, a, a medieval uh, vibe our faction does. Um, you know, we have a fortress, we have a stronghold. Uh, Alex and I are, have fought a lot of battles with a lot of the other factions. We've also incurred some alien leftovers because not everybody left when the mothership left. There were some struggles of technology, some struggles of aliens or battles. There's a history on Alex's side of the family of, of his uh, grandfather, I believe. Uh, and I don't want to give too much of the story, but his grandfather is very into mental and recovering some technology. So that for me, there was so much backstory. They have... Matt and Jeremy have gone overboard. They've got like six and a half years worth of yeah. potential storyboard written. And it's not one of these, oh, here's this half-assed pilot. Here's this half-assed season one. Who knows what happens season two? No, they've got a storyboard. And this is like one of those like, okay, I want to like, I want to know the end of this book. Like, this is an incredible storyboard. There's, there's character arcs for all the different characters. There's my character who is kind of a, kind of a cross between um, uh, a, a really smart um, savant when it comes to uh, uh, applying a lot of the alien technology into weaponry um, that you wouldn't notice because he has such eclectic taste. He's a big fan of our era now, 20th and 21st century. So he's going to dress like uh, with Hawaiian shirts and, and board shorts and goofy hats with souvenir pins. And this is all things that over time he scavenged anything he can find. Like we, we have our own man cave that Alex and I have that's all scavenged stuff that is, you know, hundreds of years old that nobody else thinks is valuable, but like it's our thing. We dig it. It just happens to be uh, something that we're into. And we like the music from there. We like heavy metal from that era. So our characters are relatable to people nowadays because the music they understand, some of the styles they get, um, you know, but at the same time, we're dealing with futuristic um, circumstances. So for m myself, reading the character, it wasn't the big door guy. It wasn't um, your typical badass fighter warrior, which is still cool, but there were layers to this Bishop character. Now this Bishop character is best friends I mean, uh, the, the, the character is best friends with Alex Ponovitz's character who, who plays Bishop. My character's name is Thatch. And Thatch has that relationship like a number two. A number two in command, but a guy that's also very implemental in a lot of our technology and a lot of our weaponry. Because um, Thatch just does a really good job because he's so eclectic. His brain doesn't work like other people's because he has no style. His style is a hodgepodge of whatever he thinks is cool. He looks like somebody's, like three or four people's closets threw up on him, his, his thatch of style. If it's cool, oh, I'll wear it. But his brain doesn't really work like, like, like other people of that time. Like, and, and, but his relationship with Bishop, because he's number two, is supportive. But also there's a relationship with Mika, who is Bishop's daughter. Now, Bishop's daughter is very much like her father. She's very aggressive. She's very warrior-minded. Uh, she's a powerful female character who is also young. Now, Alex is your typical father who's in charge. We've got a badass fortress. We don't need to go look for trouble. Nobody's going to come and mess with us. Let's live well, be well. Because, you know, Alex is, is a legendary, feared warrior on what's left of Earth, like Everybody knows who Bishop is. And the last thing you want to do is basically, you know, wake up the dragon or wake up Bishop. So when he sees his daughter, who's naturally following his footsteps, who wants to improve, who wants to be a leader, who wants to grow, he's a little bit hesitant on that because as a father, he's not ready to see his little girl grow up. Now I'm in the middle because no I'm kind of like an uncle. I'm kind of like an yeah. uncle. So I'm trying to, you know, Obviously, that Mika puts a lot of faith in my character and talks to me. And then I try to backdoor and smooth things over with a guy who's the head boss, who's also my friend, but also like, hey, you know, lighten up on her a little bit. She's right. And then, of course, she knows a lot of things that neither one of us do, because most of the time, him and I are real happy sitting in the den getting hammered, telling more stories, which is, you know, kind of what old soldiers do, <laughs> you know what I mean, until it's time to do something. So reading the complexity of the characters really attracted me because every character that Matt and Jeremy have written 
just in the scenes that I was in, the, the arcs are incredible. And then you look at the performances of the other actors that we have involved. Um, they're just so solid. We've got a great collection of really incredible, talented actors that are just, uh, they've really absorbed these characters. They've absorbed the world already. As small as a world we've created, even our set designs, uh, you look at some of our set designs on camera, you can't tell the difference between what we put together and some really big budget things that are out there. Like this is, this is not your cheap early days Doctor Who with duct tape and aluminum foil aliens. I mean, this is every scene, every faction <clears throat> has its own unique look, its own, uh, you can vibe how they approach things and how they think things should be. So right away, there kind of is a faction for everyone. And that intrigued me as well as one of the key ingredients was the fan inclusion. Because I come from an industry that is very dominantly fan participation. A lot of the stuff we do is we're basically trying to give the fans what they want. You know, it's not like you, this is a unique opportunity where as we're building this, we have our outline, we have our storyboard, but we also have the ability to kind of get our audience involved as it grows, kind of like the books back in the day, similar, if I had to talk about where you could choose your own ending. I don't know if you guys remember those books back in the day, yeah, yeah. which was a fun journey. Maybe you like this particular character more. You like this, you know, this has that potential with a fan base because there may be a character that is resonating more with the fans. And Matt and Jeremy have character art for these fans where the fans will get an opportunity to have some input. And very rarely does that happen for us in sci-fi fantasy fans. You know what I mean? Most of the time, you know, yeah. we'll watch the series, get invested, and then we'll get some ending or something. We go, where the, where the fuck did that come from? Like, yeah, no, like did somebody, funny. like, did they change writers? Like, yeah, <laughs> so. How the startups you know. build is trying to listen to their users. You know, yeah. and how yeah. Hollywood has traditionally built is like, a focus group of fans and then go in the lab with a big budget and come out the other side and get whatever you get. So there's right. definitely some cool things that you guys are doing of like building as you go. Um, so I guess I'm curious with, and, and it, I think part of how serial you're, you're making it, you know, it, it can allow a dystopian world to thrive. You know, you don't have yes. to push towards the Hollywood ending where one faction wins and humanity is great now. And so there's definitely a lot of freedom in that. And Neil, how are you, do you know the end of this already or how does it, <laughs> are you really making it up as you go? No, it's not making, and I'm going to step in on this one a little bit because it's, I, I aggravated the hell out of Matt and Jeremy. It's not so much, we have a place where we want to go, but where we have is we have very solid options and we have the ability to let the series grow within its parameters. I mean, it's not foot loose, like, you know, it's not going to be. Uh, it's going to stay within the story. It's going to stay within the characters and as the characters grow. But there's so many tools that we're allowed to tease our audience and also please our audience, which I don't think in a lot of shows, you get that ability to have that that impact or that live action input. And uh, the artwork on it's incredible. Uh, just even some of the graphic artwork and the performances. But one of the, the biggest thing, like I said, is the community which we really stress with Gen Zeros is that community because it is a community. They're going to be able to really be a part of something that is unique and it's going to be, uh, maybe it's a future how stuff's going to be done. Who knows? I mean, no one knows when something's first starting out. Like some people might say, oh shit, that'll never work. Well, you know what? A lot of people said that about a lot of things. You know, I'm sure they told the Wright brothers that too. Well, yeah. what are you going to fly for? It's never going to work. Well, and, you know, uh, I have full faith in this. It'll work. Did you talk to the streamers and the more traditional um, outlets to try and move from an NFT project to a live action? Or was it just thinking, hey, I'm live action. Now this great opportunity came to continue to host the content on my site and build assets around it. And is that kind of like how deliberate versus like a, you know, path of least resistance did it kind of play out? No, I mean, that's a great question. I, I mean... Well, two things. One, you're gonna have to give me permission to share, and I can share. I can show you the image of what uh, uh, Paul's uh, character looks like in the in the NFTs. But um, no, I, my, so my background is technology. I've been in tech for almost 20 years. I've um, and and more specifically, consumer engagement technology. I've sold a couple of companies to major fashion um, billion dollar fashion retailers. Clearly, um, but it's. It was all in predictive tech, but the biggest thing you learn is that 
trying to force technology into something is the worst thing you can do, right? We've all had that thing where you're you're enjoying something and all of a sudden they try to put tech in it. It's, it's the, the analogy I always use is a great, great technology is like a great referee. You know that they're there for the game or the, or the match or whatever it is, but they don't get in the way. They just make it better. When they blow the whistle or when they interrupt, it makes total sense that they did. And they just keep the flow and it makes sense. So when we, although we raised the money from the NFTs, the reason that we ended up actually changing paths as we were going and going towards this multimedia live action comic, live action comic was because Matt and Jeremy and with input from Paul and Alex, the story itself was so strong that the yeah. NFTs just provide an extra benefit. So to your, to your question, yes, we've already been speaking with uh, both streamers and uh, movie production companies that are both interested in taking it forward in different ways. The NFTs, if anything, may be a, a, a consumer, um, uh, it'll enhance the experience, but it won't be required for it. And a, a good analogy is when you think about Comic-Con, right? So we went down, we took this down to Comic-Con, but let, let's back up even one step beyond that. Star Trek. There's lots of people like myself that watch Star Trek and love it. And I grew up on Star Trek, the next generation, watched all the episodes on whatever at night it was, but that's as far as my fandom went. But then you have the people that go a little bit further down and they, they go out and they go find the books and they read the fan fiction and they go a bit deeper. And then you go one level even further you got the people showing up at Comic-Con wearing the full outfits they made themselves and, the, you know, the, all the makeup and whatever else. And I think what you're seeing in, in today's world with, um, with, with the invent of, of YouTube and all these things, hell, if you Google Game of Thrones to go on YouTube, you can find people going into every backstory and, and exploring these things and, and, and explaining what characters went and where they go. And I think what we are seeing is exactly what you said a second ago. We wanted to create something where we listen to the fans and we listen and we evolve things as we go. Um, and again, back to me, I'm just such a big nerd that literally I look at all the data. Like we've had tens of thousands of views and we will look at how long do they spend rewatching a certain character, which characters NFTs are trading more than the others. Even within those NFTs, which ones do they like more than the other? Do they like the ones where Paul has battle damage all over his face? Or do they like the ones where he's, we actually gave him a mohawk. And, and so you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't called Paul yet, but he might have hair when, when we go back to the next season. Um, uh. But what's really interesting is the reception that the streamers and the film production companies have had is one of extreme interest because the landscape's changing around them. And you think about all these streamers and everyone is looking for crowd engagement. So when we rolled out, pieces oh you so i got disa disabled on the sharing there but when we rolled out these pieces that allowed the fans to get involved when we went to comic-con we did we, we had four of the cast members five of the cast members come with us um we actually all stayed in a big brother house together one thing that actually is underrated about our show is how amazing the cast and crew is and how they, they get along like a true family um so we all stayed in this one big big brother kind of house together but the cast signings that were due to last 60 minutes almost last three hours a couple of times because we had a lineup of fans that had watched the show, had discovered it, and they were coming in and telling us things like, Alex, I don't think Vika's your daughter. I think it's, I think it's Thatch's daughter. And like, they're going off on like these weird, we're like, what are you talking about? We've only released eight chapters. And it was really, really cool to see. But, but as Paul said, the thing that I'm enjoying most is Matt and Jeremy have created these 10 factions. We've only released uh, five of them and we've hinted at a six to the community, but the, we always ask the community, which faction are you? That was the big tagline with, with what we do. And as they came through our exhibit, there's no winner. Some people love being the purity of, of Aurora, which is Paul's clan. Some love uh, uh, being the villains or what is perceived to be a villain right now with children of them. Some love the the remnants of the US military. And it's fascinating to see what everyone goes with. But the artwork that has been created for the show, I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but the quality of the of the, like the detail within the action that our, our team has put in allows the fans to come right in and read like there's little 
you know, hints on here where you can come in and read about different pieces, but every NFT is different. Every NFT is unique, whether it's um, the armor that, that, that Paul's wearing, whether it his, he's got black eyes and other ones, whether it's different pieces, but what that allows is that depths of fandom I was talking about. People get to go in and collect these things and help shape the experience based on how is it resonating. And then using things like the comic books, we can take small arcs off on a journey and see how they go and then maybe introduce them later. But it's a whole new way of telling stories. And, that, and, and sorry, I rambled for a while there. But to answer your question directly, what we're finding with the streamers and the, the film production companies is they all know this is coming. They all know that the um, the way people engage with um, technology is different. People always say that that Gen Gen Z is they have a short attention span, but it's not true. They don't. They're just when they find something they're into, they just go deep, and then they swipe until they find the next thing they go into, and then they go deep. And we're we're finding that um, luckily people are going deep on our product, so it's it's pretty exciting. Cool. Yeah, that that's uh that's really great to hear. It must be a good feeling to have super fans at an early stage. Um and have you guys seen in Hollywood also just or in the film industry this um more dystopian uh being just generally accepted, you know, in this kind of post-pandemic recovery. Um I personally know I've just been going. I've seen sci-fi on Hacker Noon, sci-fi stories are being more well read than they were before you know, as we've been known more for software development and web three technologies. And personally, you know, I've been seeing it a lot as well. Like, did that attract you to work on this project? And or do you feel kind of opportunistic of going down the, you know, dystopian post pandemic? I mean, it's not a pandemic in your world, but it is <laughs> the, the idea that the world can end is like, uh, I feel like it's just much more on people's minds than it was, you know, five years ago. Well, I think, especially for science fiction and fantasy fans, that's something that we're all uh, aware of that it could happen. From solar flares that could wipe the crust off the face of the planet, from, uh, you know, the stars breaking down, from meteor impacts. There's Climate change. If you're a sci-fi, yeah, climate change. There's so many things that could just, one little hiccup. I mean, my God, you know, we ran out of toilet paper and everybody went ape shit. So, I mean... <laughs> It's a real, in today's world of, you know, I, uh, you know, getting things now or same day delivery or getting it tomorrow within 24 hours, uh, you know, we become a world of consumers. We consume a lot of things. So uh, in a world where that isn't a thing anymore, where you have to go out and hunt for something, you have to go out and find something, you have to grow food if you want to eat, you have to uh, you know, husbandry animals, if you're going to eat meat, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things you're going to have to learn um, that are retro as far as what our ancestors did a long time ago, but it's not, most of us don't know how to do that now, you know, so that kind of a, a culture shock, I think, especially sci-fi fantasy fans are completely aware, like, oh yeah, that could happen, that could happen, so it's not a hard, it's not a hard twist, I mean, uh, I think, you know, maybe a long time ago, uh, you know, in television stuff, there were always very happy stories. And when I mean, you go back to to even like Wizard of Oz, when the first Wizard of Oz came, that just scared the hell out of everybody. Like people were were literally terrified about Wizard of Oz. And, you know, and as the society has progressed, you know, Wizard of Oz is almost like a, a children's movie now. You go back and look at, oh, it's a classic. It's a classic. But, you know, back then they weren't, even though they were dealing with with world wars and, and whatnot and coming through all that, you they still didn't expect, you know, that type of uh, of world that scared the hell out of them. So I think as through all the years between Road Warrior and Escape from New York and all these incredible uh, you know Hunger Games and and all the and, and Maze Runner and all these different things that have come along, uh, people kind of get the fact that, you know, it wouldn't take much to push something off the edge and uh, either something more intelligent or more superior wipe us out or even our own factions uh, doing a huge power grab and cutting everybody else out of it. So those are things that are, I think, uh, everybody thinks that it could happen, which is an easy sell. When you're trying to sell something that's not within the realm of possibility, even though that's what you do with fantasy and science fiction, this has a little truth of a core to it because um, the reasons that they come here, the reasons that they come back in, in, the, in the story that Matt and Jeremy have written, 
Because that was one of the things I picked them apart. Why'd they come here? What do they need? What do they need? What do they need from our plant that they can't get anywhere else? You know, like what's so important? I mean, what, minerals? I mean, they got space rocks. They got gold rocks the size of Texas floating around in space. Like, you know, why take a whole planet? You know what I mean? You know, so, and then the storyline they explained to me, it made sense to say, okay, I get that. I understand what's going on. Not to stooge off where we're going with the story, but what Matt and Jeremy have lined up makes a very weird kind of sense, especially if you go back through the history of our own planet with old technologies and, 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 and ruins of ancient architecture and buildings and stories of Atlantis and where do all these things come from? It all kind of plays into, into a part of how many civilizations existed before they got wiped up? How many times did they get wiped up? Is this the first time that we had enough advanced enough as a species to survive, to remember what happened and to try to come out on the other side of it a little bit better. So, you know, I may be told too much there. But, you know, <laughs> I'm excited about it. So That's there's awesome. a lot there. You'll have to figure it out. And uh, getting back to kind of the staff and the team, are they um, all compensated also in NFTs? Like how connected or separated is like kind of the, the people making it with the, you know, the primary assets around it? Um, or is it just kind of, is it a split between like kind of funding the projects and then getting the cash in and then kind of doing normal operations or how does that uh, breakdown kind of work? No, that's a great question. Um, as we said, clearly when everything launched, NFTs were in a different place. It was something that there was a lot of momentum with them. But the way that we wrote the contracts, um, no, everyone still participates depending on how, when the show gets picked up and what it does. It was something that we did purposefully. It's something, um, you know, it's it's not like everyone's taking 15, 20%. Clearly that wouldn't work, but just the math wouldn't work. But we wanted people to feel like they own the show and that, and that it was important to them. So yeah, not only the NFT revenue, the comic revenue, um, and even the first time the show gets picked up there, everything's kind of put in different ways to, uh, to help everyone feel part of the family. And this is a good synergy too with this project. That's one of the things that impressed me too when I came on board was you know, from, from wardrobe to, to hair and makeup, to set design, to transportation, to production. There's so many incredibly qualified people that are have done some pretty big projects and been a part of some pretty big projects that understand what they're doing is groundbreaking. You know, I mean, this is, you know, and, and my involvement with this is not a, well, I'm going to get rich and buy a house in Hawaii or, or whatever. That's not why I got on board with this. I got on board with this because I truly believe in this story. I believe in the the preservation of the art and the performances that are being put into the story. And this is something that, you know, can really leave a mark for entertainment because of the story and because of the people involved. And I think over time, like anything, you know, when, when Jeff Bezos started Amazon, he was selling packages out of his garage or whatever he was doing, the books, wasn't it? Re reselling books or something, right? All, all, all so, yeah. Yeah, an old bookstore. So, in its infancy now, no, everyone on board now is not in board to like, oh, once NFT comes up, we're going to do a big crash cab and boot scoot and boogie. That's not what it is. This is something that everybody invests their time, they invest their creativity, and we continue this to grow. You know, if this thing grows, who knows what, you know, the, it's at the end of the rainbow. I mean, who knows that Star Wars action figures were going to be as big as they were. I mean, you know, yeah. I don't even think George Lucas gave a shit about action figures in the beginning of it. I heard a story about yeah, that. It was probably time. like one extra licensing thing. He's like, sure, I'll sign it. And suddenly this yeah. industry is just added to the empire. The billion dollar tour industry. So, yeah. you know, but that's the one thing that's super attractive about this as an artist, as an actor, is freedom of performance, uh, connection with your audience, connection with the community, and building something unique that's actually good. You know, it's been a long time since we've had something fantasy oriented that we could sink their teeth in. I mean, my last personal, my last personal favorite sci-fi fantasy was Firefly, you know, Serenity. I love that show, yeah. you know, it, it, it went its different way, but I, I, I got the concept. There was a lot of, uh, of cool things that, yes, there was a little dystopian and, and all that other stuff, but it was, a cool show that I got invested with the characters and I wanted to see where they went. Okay, this is this is a different show. This isn't a, a band of friends that are, or even non-friends that are put together and have becoming friends, you know, skipping around space. This is us. We can't get off the planet. This is what we have left. 
And uh, uh, we're trying to pick up the pieces of one hell of a bad ass whipping. And if it comes back, how do we survive? It's not, hey, how do we destroy the alien race? How do we go back to their home world and conquer them? No, it's how do we survive? Yeah. How do we continue as humanity? And what is, what is humanity in this new future? Because all, all borders are changed. All rules are changed. Just not even uh, just, just with the different opportunities that are presented because of the uh, influx of the alien technology and the reverse of the alien technology. You know, shit goes in a lot of crazy ways. It's cool. So where, where do you guys stand on the existence of real aliens? <laughs> oh, listen, I know I'm probably going to get shot. And I grew up in a, you know, in South Carolina. It was a very you know, in Christian atmosphere. And I believe in God. But is the more you know about planets and stars, you got to be out of your freaking mind if you think we're the only thing out there. You know, whether it can get to us or we can get to it, whether we've been visited, I don't know. But there's just too many opportunities for something else to be going along. And I imagine if it is, it's probably going to be like nothing that we've imagined. Or we're the blueprint and it'll be just like us, one of the two. So <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with Paul. I think just the sheer math, again, being a huge nerd, the sheer math of it is just... Math course, is ridiculous. Of course, there's something else out there. But yeah, I think... It's like, what, what, it's like over a thousand Goldilocks plants or something like that in our galaxy yeah. alone or some ridiculous thing. Yeah, it's crazy. And then, and then, and then the the only thing for me though, which actually unfortunately runs contrary to to our whole premise, is I think it's a little vain to think that 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 we're the focus of their attention. They're coming, they're coming here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, we need a story, Neil. So yes, we are the focus. We are the focus. No, but, but I watched, I watched the first chapter. Point, they're coming but, for the resources. But to that point, exactly, yeah. they didn't come for us. Uh huh. Yeah, but here to that point though, Matt and Jeremy also explained that. You know, they explained why they're coming around i mean i don't want to i can't really tell that can i neil uh yeah you can give the why they came uh, the why uh, they came for the recess but, 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 but the, you, you can give you can give the why they came and then stop <laughs> um yeah i'm trying to just so it makes sense but yeah okay i'll shut up before i end up stooging off infinity wars or something so um, maybe, um, maybe one question about your career, like as you were kind of coming up in the '90s, do you think this oh kind of NFT oh. boom would be uh, would have, your trajectory would have been different? Like, do you feel like you should have like a million big show NFTs, like kind of sitting in your crypto wallet, and like owner over that ownership over that character could have been different if like the technology and the infrastructure was more like it is in this case? Oh, if I didn't know what I know now, number one, I wouldn't have done the big show character to begin with. I'd have kept my real name because I don't own the intellectual property of the big show, WWE does. So once I left WWE, all that intellectual property, they own. So they can do whatever that now they can make NFTs. They can do whatever they want. That's it's not, I'm like, I'm like the actor that played Captain America. I'm not really Captain America in their minds. They own the, the intellectual property, just like Marvel studios owns a character or DC owns a character. So yeah, going back in time, uh, I should have used my real name. But when I started, wrestlers didn't use their real name because they always had a gimmick name. I mean, I used to stay in the hotels and I used to stay under Richard Kimball, which was the fugitive. That was my <laughs> old hotel alias was Richard Kimball, you know, because, awesome. you know, this is back before the internet, but if the fans were always this group of fans that always talk, and if somebody found out your real name, then they call your hotel and all that stuff. So. You know, it's it's a different time now, and it, it's moving at a faster pace. I mean, look how technology has changed just in the past 50 years, from the 1970s to now. You know, I'm 50 years old, so I was born in 72. Technology changed from, you know, having a, uh, a little, like a Walkman, you know what I mean, that, you, you know, to, to CD players, to portable DVD players, to... Now music to like everything I need. I, I, I can put on my Apple Watch. On, I caught Eight Mile on TV last night, and he's still walking around with a Walkman. And that was like a 2000 whatever movie. And you have right, yeah. with a Walkman in his hands, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, like it's like, but but that. So who knows what kind of technology we're going with? And that's a, the. I think that's the attraction for us that are science fiction fantasy fans is that possibility. Look at Star Trek. Kurt with a communicator. You know, like, I mean, that's basically a StarTac telephone. Yeah. You know what I mean? When the StarTac's right now, it's even further. I mean, uh, 
get smart. You know, he talked into a shoe or the watch or all the spy movies. You could talk and use your watch for a phone. Like, you like you know, what cool, today's uh, science fiction is tomorrow science fact. So. Do you have any cool uh, science facts, you know, coming up in how you're filming it? Is there any kind of uh, visual representations of future technologies that oh, yeah. are particularly excited about? Oh, yeah, about? yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I, ha I have, like, my character has created a very, very cool weapon uh, that also, um, it's just really badass. I've, the, the, the basic premise of the weapon is, is with the alien technology that I was able to wormhole think. Um, because obviously the way these aliens get around, they're not taking, you know, 20,000 years to travel through space and time. They're traveling through space and time, but they're also able to manipulate and fold space. So I've been able to localize with a gauntlet, so to speak, um, that has the ability to control gravity. So yeah, I can create basically in a small room, say there's 10 bad guys, I can create the gravity of a small continent in a, 30 foot area just flatten everything so it's kind of my uh uh there's a price to pay for it as anything you don't want anything too op there's a price to pay for it which will be explained in the show as it moves on but it's one of those uh final solution like uh uh it's it's uh it's my get out of jail free weapon so but there is a price for it which i like because i i like the fact that um something that powerful that wasn't built by us Though we may be able to get it to the toaster to work, occasionally we're going to burn toast because we don't know how to set it. To me, that makes kind of sense. So there's going to be things, <laughs> that, I, there's yeah, going we, to be uh, things that, I, that we have made work, but it wasn't supposed to work like that. And there's a price for it. So, you know, we also, consequences uh, have actions. Actions have consequences. We also removed the, a lot of the time, we, we use technology to remove a lot of time travel requires. So right. that allowed us to, you know, use the whole globe and telling stories. So there's factions in the Middle East, there's factions in Asia, and they can have conversations or be in the same room as someone else. So they don't need a 20 hour travel day. It might be an hour kind of thing. So using some things like that help the story, but also you see that tech coming with Hyperloop. You see that tech coming with, with, you know, supersonic jets and whatnot. It's so all these things are, uh, as Paul was saying, you know, science fiction becomes science fact pretty quick. Pretty quick. Yeah. So Cool. And what's um, what's kind of next on your minds for how, like, if we're sitting here, you know, kind of a year from now, what does the community of Gen Zeros and this fan base kind of look like? It's a great question. Um, I think it's going to depend a lot on our next partner. Um, there's a couple of front runners right now, one of which I can't really go into it, but um, one of yeah, them. Yeah, don't you stooge anything off. Yeah, I won't. I won't. <laughs> one of them has kind of a grand vision for it. And, uh, I think I think it's exciting. So what? So a, a, a year from now, though, I'll be honest. Um, hopefully, we are either in we're closing production or we're in we're in post production for whatever comes next. Um, and I think that's going to involve both. Um, as I talked about those layers for the fans, we're never going to ignore this because really, what we've created is a spark, right? We created the spark of a vision. Uh, we filmed it over two days. The cast and the crew put an incredible time to get this thing done. The vision and everything else that's kind of shaping around it. Um, we're always going to, you know, get pay homage and, and, and honor those people that have done that. So there'll be a lot of kind of fan stuff coming. We have some incredible comic artists um, that uh, have got some things that, that are brewing. So um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot coming. That's that's pretty good at not telling anything. That was a good job. <laughs> yes, the sky's the limit. Well done. Well done. Sir. Okay, well how about done. this one? How are the Netflixes and the these production companies going to follow what you're doing about how to market a new uh, live action thing? You know, like how are you going to see? How are they going to be kind of imitating what's worked or what you think will work here? So, so let me give you a, a quick story of what actually happened. So, this is the la the landscape currently. When we went to Comic-Con, we met with the organizers. The way we got a booth was there was someone else that wasn't using it this year just because of the pandemic and whatever else. And then when Comic-Con found out that we were there and we were with NFTs, they weren't super happy because a lot of the Comic-Con organizers don't like NFTs. They, they equate NFTs with a lot of these bored apes and, and kind of 
I don't want me to rip on that community because it's it's a it's you know a staple of of what that community did and how it grew. But a lot of these you know board pandas and board rhinos and board whatever like they saw it as very derivative and very predatorial on fans. So anyway, Marvel though has leaned right into this and they wanted to have a huge booth called like Marvel NFTs and whatever. And Comic Con said no. Comic Con said no to Marvel. <laughs> I didn't know that. So, and there was people walking around Comic Con with shirts that said "fuck NFTs," and literally they'd walk by the booth. You guys, rah, rah, rah. we won a lot of them over. I, I will say that once we got them in and we actually showed them the artwork and how all an NFT is at its core is a way to protect the digital rights and provide ownership to the artist. Like it literally should be the thing that they are most excited about when done properly. Anyway all these shirts people crushing it but there was a lineup for people that wanted to buy digital collectibles it was just a branding thing you take the name off it you don't call it nfts you call them digital collectibles and there was a lineup of people for these artists that, that were producing these pieces so how are they going to follow us um we've i've already had conversations with every major streaming network after this um the company that helped put this together house of kiba they're in talks with some of these groups to, to help them with their strategies. They're all looking at it. it they just won't be called NFTs. It's going to yeah, be- that's, they, You're going to get the vernacular, I think, that people are comfortable with because you're saying NFTs, NFTs non-fungible token. People get leery because they don't understand it. It's that, it's that uh, it's like back in the day when people had horses and wagons and then there was an auto vautour. Like, <laughs> you know, like, I, you know, nobody wants an auto vautour unless you're super elite or super smart, but- you know, once the language gets more defined, once everything gets put together, the right uh, format, so everyone can understand what they're getting into, what they want to collect, how they're going to collect it, how they're going to be a part of it. And the main thing that's going to drive this, yes, the collectibles, the digital collectibles and all that will drive it. But also I think the, the story and the performances, I think is going to be a big driving factor too. And this, and we know anything about big business, that there's an opportunity to create uh more revenue in anything that it's it's going to be evaluated it's going to be streamlined and it's going to work for everyone so um you know we're we're in unknown territory right now creating this and doing this so uh but at the core of it our number one i'd say uh uh prime directive is to you know protect our community and, and take care of our community with content so to okay. steal a line for prime directive from star trek that our prime directive is our community so I, I know personally, whatever I get involved with, the integrity that I maintain in the community is is my um, is one of my most important situations because uh, I, I want our fans to to really get wrapped up in Gen Zeros, feel like they're a part of it, and know that they're getting something out of it besides entertainment. Yes, yeah, it's, it's cool. These digital assets really do give them something to connect to. I think some of that mm -hmm. resistance you're talking about Comic Con isn't just. The term NFT, it's also who owns the, who gets a revenue share on all this yep. fandom. And now that you yes, sir. purchases yes, outside sir. of that ecosystem into your own uh, ecosystem or into shared ecosystems and shared wallets that aren't necessarily, you know, controlled by them. It, it, it does, uh, it's just probably much better, you know, for the fan in the long run. Um, but it's just like these corporate terms. It's like you throw out the word NFT. It helps with investors. It helps with enterprise meetings. It hurts with the fans. Yeah. It's just a term that's not, welcoming it, it shows a level of expertise that you don't need to buy a trading card you know to, yeah. to buy an original design so it's it's cool to hear your kind of stories on the ground um i guess kind and of this my, is early too i mean think yeah. about where things are going with with metaverse and stuff like that and all this digital content and whatnot and you know who knows where things are going in the future so and, and like i said this is pretty groundbreaking pretty new stuff but once the community understands that um, they're actually getting a part of something. Uh, I, I think they'll they'll definitely come around and get even more excited about it. Um, and ending kind of with, I want to be respectful of your time of kind of a, a very serious question here. You sure. know, if, if these aliens do come to Earth and they ha and they greet you first, um, mm -hmm. what would you say? How how should they treat humanity, and what should they know about us? Um, be careful. <laughs> be careful. You know, like. Uh, I would say, uh, to, as far as dealing with humanity, um, you, you can't you can't judge everybody by one. But uh, there's a reason why 
the most dominant species on the planet is the human race. And we have the ability for uh, abstract thinking and our eyes are located, located in front of our face to judge our distance to our prey. So human beings are, are very vicious and very conniving and very calculated. So uh, I, would, I would think that um, uh, an alien race of superior technology uh, either comes in uh, shock and awe, or if they try to be nice, be very careful because there's a lot of people a lot smarter than me that might have a different directive. So there you go. How's that for sci-fi dystopian enough? There you go. I love that. I, I don't think I can compete with that answer, so I'm not even going to try. <laughs> <laughs> well, insects, I think, have a small claim for world dominance as well. Even yeah. though well, very yeah, small, course, but they're course. very plentiful. Um, yeah, and most of the time, a lot of insects are dealing with a hive mind too. You yeah, know, you have, you know, there's the problem. The, not the problem. But one of the success stories of why human beings have overcome war, famine, disease, and all the things that we've overcome, and and where we've gone from rubbing sticks in the dark to light a fire to going to the moon. You know, is, is that ego and that critical thinking mind so uh it's a dangerous combo so we'll see because there's a bunch of us that would love to i'm sure there's a bunch of people that would be fascinated by other cultures and you know and and want to go tour and want to go see that other place and do all that stuff and welcome with open arms and there were some with seeds as an opportunity and then there are there'll be some that that would be terrified to death nuke first ask questions later so you know that's a beautiful thing about the world there's so many different opinions that somehow it all it all turns into a rock soup it all still works <laughs> you'll have you'll, you'll have to let me leave you with uh with paul with hair here there we go paul. oh yeah that's super nice yeah see i have that i have that same haircut but in reverse the middle's <laughs> gone the top's not there if i could still grow the middle i'd have the middle right now i can just grow a skullet and you know, I'm scared if I grow a skullet real long and I go hiking up in the Pacific Northwest, somebody will shoot me for Bigfoot. So, you know, right there now I'll go. keep the head shaved. <laughs> <laughs> I let my daughter do my last haircut. Uh, she did good. Yeah. She did good. You've got, yeah, you've yeah. got that whole Tom Cruise Mission Impossible thing going, you know, oh, pretty kind of a rogue. No haircut for four months, four or five months. Started over. How old is she? Five. Five. Well, You're brave for them. <laughs> wow yeah working he's a good on the dad. He's, early yeah he, yeah yeah you could you figure the worst case scenario you can shave your head and do a co uh -huh. so there you go yeah, there you go. Like I was thinking. 